to Bellis Park Chapel. He's always shared news of what's going on in the church here. So I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see thee, <laughs> to borrow from Joel. So it's lovely to be here, and I do bring you greetings from Bellis Park Chapel. And we've also enjoyed very much our times with Chandy and Mylena and their children. Chandy comes across the chapel, I think, uh, the Tuesday at lunch club, and also he's preached several times in the evening. So lovely to be with you. Let's just turn to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll come to our message. Let's pray together. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time that we've already enjoyed here this morning. We thank you again for your Son, our Lord Jesus. We thank you for the hope that we have in him. Truly, there is none like him. And Father, we ask that each one of us this morning would become conscious of him. If we've never yet turned to him, if we're not yet born again, then grant that today might be the day when we do come to know him. Father, bless each one of us. We pray. We think also of any who are not able to be out this morning. Perhaps they would have liked to have been here. We ask that you would bless them also. But we commit this time to you now, gracious God. We go forward in dependence and ask that you might be with us as we trust you. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, we've read already from 1 Kings chapter 10, verses 1 to 13. And there's just a sort of companion passage that we might just turn to in Matthew chapter 12. So just a few verses from Matthew chapter 12 to set the Queen of Sheba in context. Matthew chapter 12, reading from verse 38. Let me just turn to it actually in the church Bible so we're all in the same translation. Okay, yes. Matthew 12, verse 38 says here, Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see a miraculous sign from you. He answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a miraculous sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And now one greater than Jonah is here. The Queen of the South will rise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom. And now one greater than Solomon is here. So we've read about this time when the Lord Jesus was faced with some Pharisees and teachers of the law. I mentioned them already this morning in the children's talk. And these people, they were religious people. Now I, I expect that there's many religious people here. It's better to be a spiritual person and know the Lord Jesus, but you might be religious. But these Pharisees were very religious men. They'd already heard about the Lord Jesus, they knew about his miracles of healing and power, but still they had this, this statement to make to him, they said, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Teacher, we want to see a sign. And I think what they were thinking was that the Lord Jesus would do some extraordinary magic trick, that he would somehow point to the sky and perhaps he could write his name in the sky, in clouds, and then turn them to gold, something like that. Something for show, not for anyone's benefit. Just a, a sign. Well, the Lord Jesus didn't perform a trick for their amusement. Instead, he rebuked them sharply as we've read. He called them a wicked and adulterous generation. He says, none sign will be given to them except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Really, he was referring ahead to his own death, burial, and resurrection that was still to come. And then as a further rebuke, Jesus referred to the people of Nineveh and the Queen of the South. And that would have been quite a... That would have been hard for these Pharisees to take because the Lord Jesus was referring to Gentile people. 
These Pharisees were the religious Jews. They stood in the tradition of the, of the patriarchs. And here's Jesus telling them that the people of Nineveh will stand in the judgment and bear witness against the Pharisees because the people of Nineveh had listened to the preaching of the prophet Jonah. And then perhaps to make matters worse, the Lord Jesus refers to the Queen of the South and says that she will rise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom, and now one greater than Solomon is here. These people, the people of Nineveh, the Queen of the South, they seized the opportunity that God gave them to seek out and to find the truth about God. And they found him. But these Pharisees who had the divine Son of God standing in front of them, they were doing all that they could to reject him. And that's really the question we have to consider, each of us has to consider this morning. What's our response to the news about the Son of God? What's our response to the Son of God who has come into the world? So we'll look in a little bit more detail at the Queen of Sheba. In 1 Kings chapter 10. And the first thing I want to say is that she was a thirsty queen. She was a thirsty queen. Now, I don't mean that she didn't have enough to drink. I think if you were a royal person in those days, you would have had enough to drink. But she was thirsty for knowledge. She was thirsty for truth. She wanted to know. In fact, that's the heading I've given to this message this morning. She's a queen who wanted to know. She wasn't content with whatever she'd heard before. She really wanted to know. Now, I think when you were a queen in those days, just as queens and kings nowadays, you, you don't do everything by yourself. You would have a council to advise you. In the United Kingdom, that's a privy council, which still exists. Well, imagine one day that the Queen of Sheba, she's had a council meeting with her councillors. Perhaps they've been discussing the trade of the kingdom because it was a very wealthy kingdom. I think they had a great trade in frankincense and other spices. And perhaps at the end of the meeting, the queen turns to her counselors and she says, honorable advisors, we're going on a journey. A journey, your majesty. Yes, a journey to the kingdom of Israel in the north. I want to speak to King Solomon. Maybe her advisors started to sort of look at each other. Maybe this has come up by surprise on the agenda. That sometimes happens in a meeting. And they say, um, Your Majesty, we, we don't need that much from the Israelites. I mean, they're good customers for our trade. But there's nothing that needs you to go in person. We can handle it, Your Majesty. But then the Queen would have replied, Well, I'm not thinking about trade. I'm thinking about Solomon's wisdom. I want to know if the reports about King Solomon are true. It seems that he's met with the God of the universe. Maybe there was a long silence as the advisors tried to work out how to help Her Majesty just get back on the right track. Your Majesty, people do exaggerate. The glowing presence of God in the new temple that was probably the light rising over the horizon at a convenient moment. Because that was recorded that when Solomon dedicated the temple, the glory of God had shone in the temple and the priests could not stand to uh, do their service. Perhaps the man, Her Majesty replied, hmm, you could be right. I have my doubts, but I must know. I must know. And so the royal household of the kingdom of Sheba assembled an oppressive caravan of camels and camels and transportation and they made their way north to the kingdom of Israel. Some commentators believe that the queen of Sheba came from Yemen, others mention Ethiopia, but whatever they, wherever it was, it was a great distance. Some have said 1,200 miles. If a camel caravan could cover 25 miles in a day, 
Some of you are probably working this out already. That would be a journey time of 48 days. Minimum, perhaps two months, perhaps three months. A great journey. And the Lord Jesus commends the Queen of Sheba because she was prepared to make that effort in order to meet with King Solomon. He was the wisest man in all the earth at the time. That was acknowledged. But I think it's important to realise that her questions were spiritual in nature. If the text had said that she'd heard about the fame of Solomon and that was it, then we might think that she was coming to have some kind of ancient game of mastermind with Solomon that she was going to try and catch him out, ask some really difficult question that he couldn't answer. But that's not what the scripture says. It says she heard about the fame of Solomon and his relation to the name of the Lord. There was a very clear spiritual dimension to Solomon's wisdom and that's what she wanted to hear. And so she had this spiritual quest as she goes north with all her people. And I would also suggest that she valued knowledge more than material wealth. Mm. She valued knowledge more than material wealth. Mm. It says she came to Jerusalem with a very great caravan, that's of camel train, with camels carrying spices, large quantities of gold, and precious stones. Now, if you travelled through the desert in ancient times with a large quantity of gold, you didn't just have the men looking after the camels. You had soldiers, cavalry. So this would have been quite a substantial group of people going through the desert. All because she wanted to ask Solomon questions. Have you ever felt that desperate to ask questions? Well, she did. And the Lord commends her. I wonder if the Queen's treasurer shook his head the whole way along the journey. I think George Frederick Handel expressed in music something of the awe and the wonder as the Queen of Sheba arrived in Jerusalem. If you haven't listened to it, then look, go to YouTube when you get home and look up the arrival of the Queen of Sheba by Frederick Handel, and you'll get some sense of the magnificence of this caravan as it arrived in Jerusalem. Well, Solomon, he didn't think that it was madness to exchange material wealth in return for wisdom and knowledge. By the inspiration of God in Proverbs 8 verse 11, Solomon said that wisdom is more precious than rubies, and nothing you desire can compare with her. I think he understood the Queen of Sheba. I think there would have been a meeting of the minds as she came and spoke to King Solomon. And indeed the scripture says that when they got there, she came to Solomon and talked with him about all that she had on her mind. Or as the New King James Version says, she spoke with him about all that was in her heart. So they didn't waste any time. They got straight into conversation. Now, what was this all about? So she was a thirsty queen. And secondly, I would say she was a, a perceptive queen. You could also say she was a humble queen. You know, she was humble enough to listen and to learn. Humility. We need humility if we're going to be truly those who learn in life. And the scripture says that she talked with him about all that she had in her mind. And it says Solomon answered all her questions. Nothing was too hard for the king to explain to her. Now we don't actually know what she asked. We're going to have to guess. Some commentators, some of the more secular commentators, would suggest that she presented riddles for Solomon to solve. The same word here is used for hard questions. The same word is used by Samson in Judges 14 verse 12 when he does present a riddle to the wedding guests at his Philistine wedding. But as I said, there's no suggestion here that that's why she came. It was a spiritual quest. 
But the hard questions of life do seem like perplexing mysteries until we hear the truth. There are hard questions in life. Perhaps you've already asked some of them. She may have asked King Solomon, how can we know which God is true? There were many gods in the ancient world. Probably no one actually knows how many. And the queen was most likely used to seeing her people bow down before statues of all shapes and sizes. The ancient world generally was given over to idolatry. But this God whom Solomon worshipped, well, he was completely different. There were no statues, no idols. There was only one place on earth where anyone could lawfully offer sacrifices to this God. That was in Jerusalem. Only the priests who were called to the task could offer sacrifices on that one bronze altar in front of that one temple. Maybe she said to King Solomon, how can you be so sure that your God is true? How can you know that? And Solomon would have presented her with the scriptures. You know, by that point, the five, first five books of the Bible certainly were completed. Other parts of the Bible, the book of Job, most likely, substantial part of the Psalms, even Solomon's own father had been inspired by God to indict the Psalms. And so Solomon could say, here is God's revelation to mankind. Here is what God has said. And he could have explained much from the scriptures. Then she might have asked to Solomon, well, why is there so much evil in the world? Why is, there so, why, why is there so much suffering? You know, I think as a queen, as a royal monarch, she would have seen a lot of suffering. She would have heard about it in other nations. She would have seen it in her own nation. And in ancient times, to be a member of the royal family was quite a dangerous place to be. There was probably always somebody who wanted your throne. Someone who didn't agree that you should be the queen. You might be assassinated. And so she realized, I should think, that the world is a dangerous place. King Solomon could have explained the history of the world from the beginning. We are used to hearing about Eden, Adam and Eve, and the first act of disobedience. Possibly all of us are familiar with that story, that narrative in Genesis. Perhaps Solomon explained that to the Queen of Sheba for the first time. Set everything in context. We live in a fallen world. We live with the consequences of sin. We all live with the consequences of sin. And some people suffer greatly because of either their own sin or the sin of other people. There are victims in the world. And if the Queen had probed further about those who suffer and yet seem innocent, well, Solomon could have shared lessons on the sovereignty of God and the glory of God from the book of Job. I think he would have been wise enough to understand the book of Job. Maybe he was the only one wise enough to understand the book of Job, but he did. And he could have explained things from that book. And I should think another question she had was, how can I be free from my guilt? How can I be free from my guilt? I don't know if anyone here dreams about being a king or a queen. But, you know, to be a monarch in ancient times, it meant that you had a near absolute level of power. It was said of King Nebuchadnezzar that whom he would he slew and whom he would he kept alive. As the queen had said, off with his head, off with the head it went. I wonder if the queen was, again, she may have been haunted with guilt at decisions she had made which had resulted in other people dying. Because when you have that much power, if you make the wrong decision, it could have dreadful consequences. So maybe she said to Solomon, Solomon, I feel so guilty. How can I be free from my guilt? Now, if we were to answer the question for the Queen, 
we would have taken it immediately to the Lord Jesus. We, we would have explained immediately about the cross work of the Lord Jesus. We could have explained that he is the divine son of God who came into the world to save his people from their sins. We would have explained to her about the cross, the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus, and he died upon the cross as a sacrifice for sins. That he died, that he was buried, that he rose again to provide salvation for all who repent and who trust in him. Perhaps the queen had seen many priests offer blood in that pagan temples and none of that blood could ever cleanse her guilt. Jesus' blood cleanses us from all sin. So we could have answered that question for her because we have the whole Bible. But when Solomon was answering that question, the birth of the Lord Jesus was still a thousand years in the future. So how would he have explained that this queen could have her sins forgiven? Well, he would have explained to her about the promise of the Saviour. That as soon as sin entered the world in Genesis chapter 3, God gave the promise that one would come, the seed of the woman who would crush the serpent's head. There's always been a promise from the beginning of time, from the beginning of the moment of sin, there has always been a promise of salvation in Jesus Christ. Solomon could have taken her to Psalm 51, various Psalms that again speak of the forgiveness of sins. Blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven. Blessed is the one to whom God will not impute iniquity. I think Solomon would have been clear in explaining to her that salvation is by faith alone. There's nothing that she could do of herself to receive forgiveness. Abraham justified by faith in God's promise. And so salvation, whether it's the Old Testament, whether it's the New Testament, salvation is always by faith in the Son of God. Always by faith in the promised Saviour. So the Queen might have heard all of this from Solomon. And then she might have said, that's all well and good. I understand what you're saying, Solomon. But will God receive me? I don't belong to your people. I'm not the descendant of Abraham. I don't belong to the people of Israel. Would God receive me? And perhaps Solomon would have pulled out a copy of the shortest psalm in the Bible. Psalm 117 and shared it with her and said, Here's what God has said. Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Laud him, all you peoples, for his merciful kindness is great toward us. And the truth of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Yes, the Gentiles can also come in, even in the Old Testament. God saves all who trust in him. So we had a thirsty queen, a perceptive and a humble queen. Lastly, I would say that she was, or she became a believing queen. A believing queen. We don't know how long the queen spent with King Solomon, but it was long enough for the truth of what he'd said to be confirmed by what she saw. It was long enough that the truth of what he'd said was confirmed by the reality of what she saw. Verse 4 says, When the Queen of Sheba saw all the wisdom of Solomon and the palace he had built, the food on his table, the seating of his officials, the attending servants in their robes, his cupbearers, and the burnt offerings she made at the temple of the Lord, she was overwhelmed. Or as the other... King James says there was no more spirit in her. She just had this overwhelming sense of the blessedness of a people whose God is the Lord. In a sense, by faith, she was actually looking ahead and she was seeing the glory of Christ in his kingdom. She couldn't have explained that, but 
In a sense, that was possibly what she was seeing. And it says she was overwhelmed. There was no more spirit in her. I wonder if that's the moment when she finally sort of surrendered any, anything that was resisting about this one God who had revealed himself to this one nation. It wasn't her nation, it was the nation of Israel. Was that the moment when she finally yielded herself up in faith to believe in the one true God of Israel, the true God of heaven and earth? And I think that the Queen's subsequent words support the suggestion that she became a believer. She said, the report that I heard in my own country about your achievements and your wisdom is true. I did not believe these things until I came and saw with my own eyes. Indeed, not even half was told me. The blessedness of the people of Israel at that time confirmed what she'd heard. And she says, she goes on to say, how happy your men must be, how happy your officials who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. Praise be to the Lord your God who has delighted in you. She becomes a worshipper. She worships the God of Israel. In a sense, there was a, a repentance there that she turned from her idol God and she worshipped the God of Israel. Israel. She rises to bless the Lord himself. She acknowledges the sovereign grace of God in choosing Israel for his people. So she yields to the sovereignty of God. She says, praise be to the Lord your God, sorry, because of the Lord's eternal love for Israel. The Lord's eternal love for Israel. She was reformed, I think, because she trusted in God's sovereignty and having chosen the people of Israel. But you might still say, well, do we know for certain that the queen was converted? Can we actually tell? <clears throat> Some of you might have heard of this new artificial intelligence program that's going the rounds. It's called ChatGPT. Um, we've all been trying it at work. It is very clever. You go to the website, I think it's chat.openai.com, you log in, and you can ask it whatever you want. So I did ask it, was the Queen of Sheba converted? <laughs> and it gave a very evasive answer. <laughs> it basically said, we're not sure. There's actually a lot of legends have sprung up around the Queen of Sheba various legends that she had a son with King Solomon and so on but I think we can ignore all of those but what I would suggest is the fact that the Lord Jesus refers to this lady as someone whose good example will one day condemn those people who rejected him it's unlikely that on the final day of judgment when the Queen of Sheba stands up and condemns the Pharisees and the teachers it's unlikely that she's going to be sent to hell. That would have been a very bad example. So I think we can safely say that yes, she trusted in the Lord God of Israel. There was no distance too great, no price too high for her to pay in order to know the truth about the living God. And she'll be there in glory. And also there's two more hints in this passage itself. It says in verse 10, She gave the king 120 talents of gold, large quantities of spices and precious stones. She gave the king those things after she'd received the answers. She didn't purchase the answers. This was a, 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 a thank offering. She was so grateful that the king had shared so much with her that she just gave her this abundance out of gratitude. It's a kind of giving that comes from a redeemed heart. The kind of sacrificial giving that comes from those who rejoice in the God of the universe. And secondly, you know, King Solomon is happy to grant to her all that she desired, whatever she asked, besides what he had given her out of his royal bounty. 
And I think there was a, a fellowship there. A kind of a mutual fellowship among those who were saints. And really King Solomon reminds us of the Lord Jesus. He has an abundance of grace to pour out on his people. He has an abundance of grace to pour out on those who repent and trust in him. In Matthew chapter 7, the Lord Jesus says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. The Queen of Sheba travelled 1,200 miles without an invitation. She travelled all that distance without any invitation. She came in spite of any arguments that her advisors would have used to tell her not to go. She risked her reputation, her kingdom, on a quest to speak to a king whose wisdom centred on the name of the Lord. Jesus uses her as a great example, as a rebuke to those Pharisees and scribes who refused him. We are in the same position as the Pharisees and the teachers. We may not have Christ standing physically in front of us, but we do have the full canon of scripture that God has given to us. We are as responsible as those Pharisees and teachers. And so we must ask ourselves a question. How burdened am I about receiving the knowledge of God? How burdened am I about knowing the Lord Jesus Christ? What am I doing with my life and with my time? As I said, the Queen of Sheba went without an invitation, but the Lord Jesus gives us, a, he gives us an open invitation. Matthew 11, verse 28, he says, Come to me, all you who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He invites us to come to him and to receive him. So as we finish this morning, you know, let our prayer be that the Queen of Sheba shall be our example, that we shall follow in her footsteps, that we shall not rest, that we shall not tire until we know for certain that Jesus Christ is ours and that we are his. The Queen of Sheba met with a real person, we also meet with a real person when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is greater than Solomon. Solomon received wisdom from God. He was the wisest man on earth for a time. But Jesus is the wisdom of God incarnate. He is wisdom because he is divine. Have you received the Lord Jesus? And if you have received him, are you still as thirsty, still as anxious to know more about him, to grow in your knowledge of him, because we shall never exhaust him. He is inexhaustible. He is precious. He is a king. Jesus said to himself, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Amen. Amen. Let us pray together. Our gracious God and heavenly Father, we thank you for the scriptures. We thank you for your word that presents to us a saviour in the Lord Jesus. We thank you for the wisdom that we have in the scriptures. And we thank you too for the gift of the Holy Spirit who is able to lead us and to guide us into all the truth. Heavenly Father, grant that each one of us would be as anxious, as concerned as the Queen of Sheba was to discern and to find out the truth Grant that we would dedicate our lives and our time, especially that time over which no one else has control but ourselves. Help us to devote that time to deepening our knowledge of the Lord Jesus. Father, we ask for grace. We thank you for everyone here present today. We thank you for all the families that are represented here. 
And we ask that you would truly work among us. Heavenly Father, we are conscious that the work is not of ourselves, but it's a work of grace in the soul by which our eyes are opened so that we may see and know our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, bless the remainder of this day to us, we pray. Help us indeed throughout this coming week and grant that we would live as those who are united to Christ, those who have found him and who rejoice in him. Mm. Bless us now, we pray, gracious God, for we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we'll come to our...